Hi there, it's Jeff here. This revision video looks at labour supply economics. So we're going to focus on the, the supply of labour to an occupation or an industry. Labour supply basically is the number of hours or number of people uh, that are willing and able to supply their labour at a given wage rate. And you can see here that normally the labour supply curve slopes upwards as wages go up, there's a greater incentive to work. Now normally that's going to be an upward sloping labour supply curve um, as wages rise, for example, in this occupation, other workers enter the industry, perhaps attracted by the incentive of higher pay and other rewards, including overtime and bonuses. The extent to which a rise in the, the wage or salary in an occupation or industry leads to an expansion of labour supply depends on the elasticity of labour supply, and we'll cover that in this video. So a higher wage in theory leads to an expansion in labour supply, W0, where the labour supply curve cuts the y-axis, sometimes called the reservation wage, is the lowest pay rate at which people are willing to work in an occupation. And that will vary from job to job. Now, many factors affect labour supply. So, first of all, the real wage in the industry itself. What does the job pay? Adjusted for inflation. Alongside the potential for earnings growth, otherwise known as wage drift. So can you supplement your basic pay with some overtime, with some productivity related pay or perhaps a, a bonus, a profit related bonus uh, and so on and so forth. Oftentimes in jobs, the basic pay can be quite low, but you might be able to uh, add extra income from things like overtime and uh, commission payments. Another factor affecting labour supply would be the wage or the income on offer in substitute competing occupations. So if the earnings of plumbers and electricians go up, that might cause people to switch their jobs. For example, move out of teaching. Barriers to entry affect labour supply. There could be some artificially imposed limits or constraints to an industry's labour supply. Think, for example, the imposition of minimum qualifications, perhaps a degree only occupation or the need to pass professional or trade exams that can restrict supply and increase average wages. Occupational mobility of labour affects labour supply. So, for example, over time, if we see an increase in the number of industry-funded uh, apprenticeships, both at post-16 and degree level, and other types of work experience, that can increase the number of people who can work in each job. We're going to spend a little bit of time on this in a second, but the non-monetary or non-pecuniary aspects of jobs can have quite a bit, big impact on the labour supply. And we'll come on to that in a second or two. And migration can have quite a significant effect. So the international movement of people across borders can affect labour supply and occupations such as health and social care, farming, construction, and many other occupations as well. Yeah, let's spend a little bit of time thinking about non-wage factors. And this does impact on the, the total labour supply available to particular opportunities, uh, occupations. So uh, people will think about which industry they want to be working in. What's the extent of job risk and job security? What are the opportunities for career advancement and progression at pay scales? To what extent if you take a job, are you expected to work anti-social hours? And if you are, are they paid appropriately? A lot of people now look at pension schemes. How generous are the pension schemes made available to employees? Many people now, many businesses are moving away from uh, sort of final salary pension schemes. The, the, there is an opt-in, so opt-out now. You have to opt out of pensions, but oftentimes they're quite expensive to pay into. Things like the strength of vocation can have an effect. So if you take, for example, primary school teaching, many people who work as primary school teachers have a very strong sense of vocation. So too people working in the National Health Service or working in particular occupations such as being a chef. Working conditions make a difference. The terms of contracts uh, can affect labour supply. So too, the availability and the cost of training and professional development. And people with a wanderlust might choose a job where there's significant opportunity for living and working overseas. So we call these non-wage or non-pecuniary factors affecting labour supply. Now, labour supply uh, normally slopes upwards. It can shift. The curve can shift. Our diagram here shows an outward shift of labour supply from LS1 to LS2. And that can be caused by a number of factors. It could be an increase in net inward migration of workers who have the relevant skills for this occupation. 
So, for example, an increase in the supply of work visas for data scientists in, in, in their occupation. The impact of investment in human capital, in training and education, including, as we mentioned, vocational programmes and degree apprenticeships. Maybe a shift of labour supply to a fall in the relative wages in other industries. So if real wages or relative wages fall in one industry, occupation A, that might cause people to move out of occupation A into occupation B. And demography, population trends can have an effect. So it could be the case that labour supply is increasing because of a, an increase in number of school and college leavers because of a bulge in the, in the demography of their particular age group. Now, of real importance is something called the wage elasticity of labour supply, often tested in exams. So the wage elasticity depends on the nature of skills and qualifications needed, required to work in an industry. So some jobs have very specific skills or minimum education requirements, and that tends to make labour supply wage inelastic. For example, you need to uh, cover the cost, the time of learning to be an HGV driver or a bus driver, for example. When the minimum skill factor or qualification factor is low, then the pool of available labour will be large, making labour supply more elastic. And a lot of jobs in retail, entry-level jobs in tourism and hospitality are like that. The vocational nature of work can often uh, be a factor here. In jobs such as nursing and social care, people are perhaps, I have to be careful here, but people are perhaps less sensitive to changes in wages when deciding whether to work and how many hours to work. And the time period matters. So in the short run, if we get an increase in demand for bricklayers, for example, labour supply tends to be inelastic. It takes time for people to respond to incentives and, and to get the necessary training. Uh, and when labour is geographical or occupationally mobile, then labour will tend to be relatively elastic even in the short term. But when it's occupationally and geographically immobile, then that can reduce the wage elasticity of supply of labour. So in this diagram here, we've drawn a fairly elastic labour supply curve, and that's that tends to be the case for relatively lower skilled jobs. The pool of labour available to be employed is pretty high, even if the wage rate goes up a little bit. Whereas here, uh, we've drawn the labour supply curve as inelastic, perhaps a job which requires specific skills, specific training or qualifications that makes labour supply, certainly in the short term, more wage inelastic. So there we go. That was a quick revision video on labour supply economics.